on deploying servers using MDT uh, 2010 Light Touch, and of course, its integration with uh, Windows deployment services. As you can see, we have a Twitter feed for this session as well. Uh, we love questions, so feel free to send in questions either using Twitter or by just raising your hand and yell them out, and we will repeat them and answer them. So we have a filter up here uh, where we search for this specific uh, hashtag. And the nice thing about having it as a Twitter feed is that we can pick and choose the questions we would like to answer. Exactly. We don't need to pick the tricky ones. No, we normally answer them all, so we love them. Uh, my name is Johan. This is Michael. We'll be your hosts again for the next 75 minutes. And we will try to cram as many tips and tricks we can possibly do in 75 minutes from the real world, uh, building these solutions uh, on site for various scenarios and customers and uh, things like that. So here we go. Uh, we basically have four blocks for you today. First, I will kick off and dive into how MDT works with all its sequence. How many in here are using MDT, by the way? A good few of you, uh, about half of the room. I will dive into the sequences and the deployment shares and the rules and the settings. And uh, also dive into something called hydration for a while. Uh, how we can use it to deploy entire environments rather than just a single environment or a single general purpose image. Then Mike will go in for two uh, blocks and he will talk about customizations, uh, building custom widgets, uh, adding in additional settings into the environment for uh, basically further customizations. Then I will come back and I will talk about adding in the database, adding in automation, uh, things like that. And then we'll round up everything by doing a tag team of uh, solutions and tips around server deployments. So that's the plan. A little bit bouncing back and forth, but uh, that's it. And even if we seem to be very disorganized, we are not that organized, to be true. <laughs> well, some, we are. Some of us are. Yeah, some of us are. Uh, some of us, or one of us, is a little bit more dynamic. <laughs> Someone is more control freak, and that's me. Yeah. I was trying to figure out how do we actually work together, because you are so control freak, and I'm more the uh, whatever. Anyway, the point of using MDT is that it has become the facto standard for deployment unless you already are on a config manager platform. And if you are, you're probably not in this room. Uh, it's being downloaded now about 60 to 65,000 times every single month, meaning you are not alone on using these solutions. So they actually become a de facto standard. And the benefits are. Of course, you will find a vast information, uh, really much information out there about these solutions. So rather than being some, build something in-house that only you know about, by using a standard platform to build on, you really can take advantage of other people's work and steal with pride from the community and from all the expertise uh, being put into these products. The guideline is the more we can automate, the better it is the more money we'll save. So for server deployments, well, LightTouch, as you know, most of you know, has a bunch of you know, supported scenarios. But the most common ones for servers, they are actually bare metal deployments. But Michael, can you think of a scenario where it might be useful to even do a refresh of a server? Can you think of a server role? That uh, almost like like, uh, looks like a client. Like a remote desktop yeah, server host, exactly. maybe? There is actually one other. When it's, say this, um, if I have a Hyper-V host, I'm going to replace that or reinstall that. It's going to be a bare metal. But a bare metal install needs or forces me to actually boot it up from a Pixie, media, or, Pixie yeah. or something. Yeah. And I, I don't really like that. So one thing that we do in our training labs is that we do a refresh with actually without saving any user state. We just reinstall it from within the operating system because that's something I can schedule. 
Exactly. So we simply have a sequence staging WinP on the drive, reboot it, and then apply a bare metal image. But we skip the pixie part. So even a refresh scenario can be useful as well. Uh, the session title is MDT and Windows Deployment Services together. Uh, the integration that we really use is that we steal a few components from the Windows Deployment Server. And what we steal is the Pixie capability and it's, if needed, its ability to do multicast. Not so often being done for server deployments, but sometimes we want that. We do not use Windows Deployment Services to deploy the OS. We just use it to start the boot image that will connect with the MDT environment and continue. So, let me jump over to my demo environment. This is a deployment workbench from MDT 2010 Light Touch. This is the admin UI, for those of you who have not seen it before. In this UI, we uh, start to pour in content for our servers. So we start by adding in a few operating systems. And this is all the additions of Server 2008 R2. If needed, we pour in some drivers. If needed, we pour in some packages like this one for a Hyper-V to run effectively on all cores without the blue screen. And we also add in, if needed, server applications. But this share that you see right here, I create for a specific purpose, and that's for creating reference images. So in the settings for this share, I configure it to actually do a capture when I deploy that image. So what I would do is the following. I will start a virtual machine because you should always use VMs when building reference images. So why should we always use a VM to deploy a reference image? Because I said so? Yeah, that's one reason. The other reason is... Sorry, that was a comment. Yes. You can always rule out hardware issues totally out of the picture. You get the totally best image, the best, best image you can possibly get, and you can use things that are difficult to do in physical hardware. Like snapshots? Snapshots in time. And there's a, another reason. We've seen some customers uh, installing a reference image on a physical machine that will automatically download and install drivers. And that's fine, right? The only problem is that the driver also installed an application. Or a service. Or a service. Or any other darn thing. And then you have a really nice image based on a HP machine, and you try to deploy that on a virtual machine. And that service, for some reason, doesn't fire up correctly. Can't find that properties in the SMB BIOS. Great. So we, pr we prefer VMs. So I started a VM, as you can see. You see the nice Solution Accelerator's background. And it will now connect to my deployment share and uh, give me a list of available sequences. So these are my only two available sequences on my server, Windows Server Enterprise and Data Center, core. So if I select this one, I have now the option of also capturing this uh, reference image. So let me just kick off Zoom it here. Zoom it is the utility uh, we use when. Uh, it's a speaker utility. Doing things like this. Quite useful. As you can see, I'm capturing this one. So when starting this process, everything is automated. It will install the OS, it will patch it against the local SAS server. Why? Because I said so. Because in the sequence on the server that deploys this image, uh, here we go, there is an action running Windows Update. Actually twice. And in my settings, I have configured it to use a local uh, server. 
a local WSL server. If I don't specify this, it will try to go out to Microsoft Update. Don't do that. Have a local SAS server. So if I do have a local WSL server and I approve the patches for different groups, and for some reason those patches doesn't come into my reference image, what did I do wrong then? Well, the point is we are, as you are very well aware of, deploying into a work group when we build our reference images. We really don't recommend on first hand to deploy them into the domain, even though sysprep will clean out the information. The reason we normally don't deploy them into a domain is because if we do, we might get settings from the domain that we want, don't want to have in our reference image. And when we deploy into a work group, well, in WSAS, that means unknown. So we need to approve the patches for unknown computers. So now it happens that uh, a customer says, well, we, we don't allow that. We have a policy restriction, OK? So put up your own WSAS server. Are we not allowed to install servers? So you work at a company deploying servers. You're not allowed to install servers. Hmm, figure that. You do have an MTT server. Yes, I have. Install WSAS on that. Oh, yeah, you can do that. Yes, you can. So when starting that VM, I just closed it down. It will install the OS. It will install the patches. It will sysprep it, and it will capture it, and it will store the WIM file on my server. Fully automated. Now I have a reference image fully patched. Now I can take that reference image and start to use a second deployment share for production. To this deployment share, I start to add in my custom images previously created from the other deployment share. Then I add in any drivers needed for them, normally based on something like this, make, model, or whatever method you prefer to inject drivers. This is what you use. And then I create sequences. So I normally divide them into uh, different categories. So this is sequences for you know, my base servers, like a few of the most commonly deployed servers. Hyper-V host, remote desktop server, web server, domain controller replica, core server, things like that. And if I open one of these sequences, uh, for example, here. We have added custom actions. Why did I add this one? Well, because if you do have multiple drives, you maybe want to online the second disk. Um, because if a disk is seen you know, on a shared storage, uh, that disk will not be online, and maybe you want to use that. Now, the issue would be that if that disk is not existing in that machine, it will normally return a failure a failure for that, but what you can do is that say that if it doesn't show up, well, don't online the disk. If it fails, ignore the failure. Every single action that we add in here, you can see I have multiple steps partitioning. We can have conditions on them if you want to. So we can set a WMI condition here if I wanted to, that say only do this action if it actually has, you know, yeah. A second array or a second drive. But what we do here is cheat, which we are very good at. We <laughs> say that continue on error. If the disk doesn't exist, ignore it and continue. If the disk exists, online it, partition and format the drive, and go on. And then I have a C drive and a D drive. So later in the sequence, of course, we will apply the image, as usual. And then we have added some base configuration here that we do for all servers. In this case, we're adding the uh, uh, basically the SNMP components uh, using the roles and features action in uh, MDT. So we, we select that. So you can see I selected SNMP servers because HP, one of their tools, requires that. But that utility also requires us to actually create a public community for that SNMP service. So we have a VB script that simply creates that community public uh, thing. Now there's two ways of creating those custom actions, and one is to do the, well, let's, let's manually configure that and use regedit and export the register settings to a reg file, and then use regedit slash s and point to that text file. And that works really great. The only issue I have with that, doesn't provide me any logging if it fails. So I don't really like that. 
What we normally do is that we create a VB script wrapper around that feature. I'm going to show you that later on how to create those script files. So you should actually try to always create a wrapper around everything because that will also log everything. And now you can troubleshoot. You have additional error handling, things yes. like that. I don't really like the troubleshooting, but it's based on I have no clue. Just you know, do it again, and that's maybe it's uh, something. I don't know. All right. Then you see I have some hardware configuration here, specific in this case for HP servers. So for these steps, for this block, uh, sorry, that block, uh, I actually have a condition saying that only do this if make equals HP. If I'm deploying a Dell server, it will simply skip this entire section here. And then I install the HP support pack, and I also make sure to run the HP firmware uh, application that will update BIOS and firmware on the machine, on the server, to the latest version. And for this block to happen, I also have a condition and say, hey, only do this where the model equals any of these three machines. And there's a different approaches of this. We have customers saying that, well, you know, we will constantly make sure that we have the latest and the greatest BIOS version of every piece of server we have. I don't have that approach. A server that is in production, I don't fix something that works. But if I reuse it for something else, then it's safe to do a firmware upgrade. So I prefer to do it during upgrade phases. If I'm not knee, I mean, some cases you really need to, it right? It could be a break fix, right? Yeah, you it could need be. That. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, I do it this way. At deployment time, do all the firmware stuff. If it blows up, hey, you need to get a new server, and I can throw out the old one anyway. So that's going to be nice. And then, since this was a sequence to deploy a Hyper-V host, we have added the necessary components uh, to deploy a Hyper-V host. And we, so we simply selected Hyper-V in here in the roles and features. And since we like PowerShell, or actually we love PowerShell, of course, we also installed the PowerShell library for Hyper-V, which is available on CodePlex, and it allows you to do pretty cool things yeah. uh, with terms of Hyper-V. I mean, maybe some of you remembered back in the old days when we had a Windows Server 2003 servers. You remember that? 100 years ago. Anyway, in that case, we had something called support tools and resource kit tools. And you, know, you didn't need those tools the first day. But eventually, something went terribly wrong, and you needed those tools. Now, do you really think it's funny to install support tools and tools to fix something on something that is broken? The likeliness of, of being able to install these tools on something that is broken is going to make it worse. That's why we need to have the tools in from the beginning. And if you don't automate this process, you will never install them until you need them. And then you will break the machine even worse. Yeah. Always so, happens. So, and just to add a final touch to this, we actually added a, 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 a VB script that will send us an email when the server is completed. And we also attach the log files for the deployment from that server. So that's, that's one of the most common things we've been asked for. It's like, it's so easy. How many would you like to have the send an email when the server is done and ready for production? OK, great. No, it's a, <laughs> that's a VB script, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. there exists PowerShell scripts. You can certainly do it in PowerShell. We yeah. wrote the VB script because we wanted to work on every single server release. And we don't always have PowerShell in that scenario. Yeah. You can download this script from our blogs. So he so, is the, <laughs> he is the de deploymentbunny.com. Yeah. And uh, I'm deploymentresearch.com. Yeah. So. He's the organized. I'm the other one. Uh, anyway, uh, there's another thing that we are working on right now. And that is the uh, capability of doing real-time logging. I have, it's not done yet, but I'm working on it. Hopefully in the next month or so, it will be something that will constantly keep on updating the event log from the deployment server. So you can use whatever tool you like to go into the event log and see what stage the server are in right now. Anybody wants that? Yeah, I would like yeah, to have great. one. <laughs> it's going no. to be on the deployment bunny anyway. So for now, we are sending an email when it's completed. So 
And we have similar things for the, for the other servers. For example, the sequence that deploys the domain controller replica obviously will have the actions uh, that will uh, install and configure Active Directory as a new domain controller replica in this specific domain, things like that. And, and this might seem very odd. How, how many domain controllers do you really need to install? Uh, two, right? Maybe, if you don't have a bunch of branch offices. But here's the story. So if we do have everything as a sequence, let's say that your second domain controller just for some reason blows up. And it's like, oh god, I need to restore that, you know? And you don't really want to restore that. So you're going to reinstall that. So what, what password did I use the last time? What configuration did I use last time? What settings did I use last time? I want to check my documentation. So you're going to rip out the documentation that says how to install a backup domain controller using NT4. Yeah, we didn't update that. So then you're going to be guessing on how you did the server. And I don't really like to be guessing. So we create t test sequences for basically everything, just because that will be a part of the disaster recovery plan. If it blows up, F12, select backup domain controller, and you're good to go. And it will be perfectly correctly installed. In fact, we are using this exact utilities, the same methods, to build our entire lab environment here at TechEd. So we have ready-made sequences that will install the first domain controller and also actually configure DHCP on that one, create a scope, etc., for that DHCP server and then create a bunch of users and OUs. We have a second sequence creating a domain controller replica because you're supposed to have that. And then we have a sequence that will deploy our deployment server. That's, that's actually quite cool. It is. So I will install, in this case, I add in Office for the Act Tools needs it. I add in the Log Viewer because I like it. I install Windows Deployment Services because we need Pixie. And for my light touch servers, I installed SQL Server Express and its related components as well. All fully automated. And I'm now using the PowerShell library because the cool thing about um, MDT, well, let me jump to my uh, right folder here. The cool thing about the MDT is that everything I do something in the UI. Say I go here and create a folder, test. In the end of that wizard, there is a view script button that will give me the PowerShell command to do exactly what I did in the UI. And you can actually do more things in PowerShell that you can in the UI. So what I did, I was simply creating a PowerShell script that will create my deployment chair. I also wrote the PowerShell script that will create all the VMs that I'm using. And the way I put this all together, and Michael will demonstrate this in, in more detail when we talk about the rules, but on the uh, media items I'm using here, I'm configuring different settings for different servers, in this case based on you know, MAC address assigning different IP addresses and such. So it really gives me a, sort of a flexible way of, of, of uh, building this. And if you go to my blog, you can actually download the hydration environment that we are using here in TechEd if you want to start playing around with this. It's a massive 72K download. Maybe you need to have some hard wire to, to be able to download that. Wireless could be very time consuming. It's different, you know, 300 board modem and yeah, it takes a while. I remember that. It's your oh. turn. It's my turn. So uh, flip the switch. I'm going to flip the switch. <laughs> I don't know how to flip a switch. Flip, switch, switch is flipped. So one of the great things about MDT is the, uh, it's the rules. And we, we usually talk about bending the rules. Just using the rules as they were intended to use is not that funny. It's more funny when you do things you weren't supposed to do. Anyway, the rules 
uh, when you start realize how they work, you also realize that this is, this is not really meant for only deployment. There's some genius behind it that actually created some kind of framework because you can use it for whatever you like. It is intended to be used this way. So it's very open. We use VBScript that is fully supported. HTA, which is kind of universal, universal and very simple <laughs> to use. Uh, there is a Western editor from Coldplex you can download. I'm going to show you that. Um, and one of the things that is the big difference between client deployment and server deployment is that when we do client deployment, everything is supposed to be as streamlined, as boring, as look-alike as possible. Treat all the users as you know, one big thing. Don't have any differences. Well, we can't do that with servers. So in many cases, I do have customers using Configuration Manager to deploy all the clients. But they use light touch for servers. Why? Because there's so many variations. And it takes like five minutes to pop up the wizard editor and throw in a couple of ask this. And then you have a menu and you can select things in the wizard. And sometimes we have customers that seems a little bit hesitant to put an agent on the server managed yep. by the same group that also manages client because Technically, that could be the case you're accidentally deploying an OS image now, Windows 7, upgrading all your main controllers to Windows 7. That would be bad. Mm. If, if you do that, run fast in another direction. To another country. To without, another country. Uh, <laughs> what do they call it in English? Ex extradition? Yeah, yes, yes. Is sure. it called extradition? Or, yeah. yeah. It's very important. Check that first. <laughs> that they don't have it. Yeah, that's your <laughs> user exit. It's just get away, right? So um, we can bend these rules a bit, and we can customize MDT pretty much. I think you are one, right? That looks like yours. Yeah. I have a messy desktop. Has to be mine. Uh, and there are a <laughs> bunch of things you can do. Um, and, you know, let's just check the easy stuff. Every custom settings.ini, there's two files, bootstrap.ini and custom settings.ini. That is the same file format used in two different locations and two different um, times. You use the bootstrap.ini to find the custom settings.ini, meaning that bootstrap.ini is stuck on the media, on the WIM file, on the ISO image, whatever. That's the bootstrap. Every time you modify the bootstrap, you need to modify the media. So what we'd like to do is to keep the bootstrap.ini file as empty as possible. Normally, it only contains the, here is the deployment share. Go there. Yeah, the deploy root value. Yeah. So next up is we have a, a settings block called settings. And it has a priority of default. And it has the properties of my custom property, which is bogus. That means that it's going to read the settings sections and find the priority, which is in this case is default, and then go to the default and set all these variables to different things. And one thing that we know is that when people you know, play with the settings file, custom settings.ini, modify rules and things, the first time you, you speak with these guys, it's like, oh, it takes forever. What do you mean forever? Oh, well, every time I do a modification, I need to generate a new media, find a new blank machine, and install the machine, and see if everything works. So for every change I do, it takes like one and a half hour to verify I did it the right way. Yeah, that's pretty time consuming. <laughs> I don't do that, because there's no point of doing that. You can, of course, it's, as a, it's a, I mean, it's a computer. You can cheat, right? We can simulate a deployment. In and how you many seconds? Uh, yeah, three. You simulate like this. You 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 you, you just open a command prompt and you get into the scripts folder. The 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 thing that gathers everything is called CTI gather, and then you just point to whatever INI file you would like to test, and then you can see if everything is going the way it should do, like that. I just noted that the Twitter feed is like. Empty. Not many questions. Oh. 
because everybody understands this anyway. So <laughs> we can see it's setting uh, different things. It's doing uh, some kind of checks, the property. And here's another nice thing. You can see it says property is hypervisor running. The, the properties we have, these are something you can use. If you go into the help file, you can find something called property definition, and that will give you about 281 plus something properties. Now, about half of all the properties you're going to see in my screen is not in that document. So when I ask, in this case, Michael Niehaus, is that, you, you cover all the uh, properties. Yeah, we do. So is VM in there? Yeah, it should be. Well, I can't find it. No, you might have slipped that one. And this one, yeah, that too. And this one, yeah, maybe that too. So not everything is documented. No, it's like 90% is documented. No, 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 97. 97. <laughs> yeah, whatever. It's Something. true. <laughs> it's close. But the thing is that, as you can see, the SVM, pretty nice to have. Is VM. If it's a VM, don't create the extra partition, for instance, which is a pretty nice setting. Yeah, the BitLock partition, we don't need it no. for virtual machines. Or the property VM platform is now Hyper-V. It's a good reason to say, well, install the latest version of the integrated components in that case. Right? If it's VMware, install the VMware edition tool. Yes. Yeah. And in this case, it says, the, is the hypervisor running? Yes. And if I have a rule saying that, well, you know, please could you install the hypervisor? That's not going to work since it's a VM. And I can also read the support VTNX and 64 bit and say, well, stop the installation from doing a Hyper V installation because the hardware doesn't support that feature anyway. Or, so, or yes. someone forgot to yeah. <laughs> enable it in BIOS. Exactly. So we could actually block an installation of a Hyper V host machine because we can know before we even try to install it, it will never work. I would like to have that within the uh, role settings that I have in the operating system, but we don't have that. So that was one simple file. Let's pick up another one. Here's another one, and here's when we start using calculations. VBScript functions in the uh, code itself. Yeah, this is not a script. It's just we do calculation. Please, please let the computer name be pc dash and a part of the serial number. Well, how does that look when we run it? It's going to look like this. CS2.ini. And the computer name is, sorry, somewhere around here. Uh, you know, there is a log file on the C yeah, drive. Yeah, but I can't just. I see it. Oh, is the computer name? It's not here, right? No. Nope. It's not. Can you open the any file you selected? Yeah. Should be there. CS2. Looks good. CS2. Did you delete the existing Miniante folder? No. I know. Sorry. I missed that one. What you also could do is to have a script called yeah, I know, something I know, I know. that always deletes it. You need to delete that one. Otherwise, it doesn't work. That works. Magic. And here you can see the uh, name now suddenly is PC-4738-44, which means that we can use um, we can calculate or recalculate values that we have, meaning that I could have a user exit script that gets something, and then without actually doing any fancy stuff in that VB script, just take the value and recalculate it in custom settings.ini, which means that I don't really need to do any fancy things. Every yeah. time you run the script that Michael does here, it creates a log file in this folder. And if you could just double click that file for me, sir. It will open up in tray 32, and often it's easier to simply review it in this utility and search for things rather than to pass the command line window. Yeah. So let's look at another one. I have a bunch of these. 
and on that drive, on the D drive, E drive, and there it is, system. Another thing you can do is this. Here's the uh, OS install flip set to no. This is something we sometimes use. Let's say that you would really like people to, they need to have the computer pre-approved in the database or custom settings.ini. So by flipping the OS install switch to no, and then flip it to yes, if it has certain conditions, you can also modify the wizard and say, well, you can't, you can't press the next at the finish in the wizard to install because the OS install flip is set to no, which it makes it possible to prohibit the installation of some machines in some locations. Other things you can do, here's another great thing, by VM. This is pretty nice, and this is different. I'd specify the by VM type, and then <laughs> I have a subsection called by VM type, and in this case, I have a subsection that says, is VM, and now I take the property called percentage is VM percentage, and if that is true, the bunny is really cool. And the do not create extra projection will be yes. So let's try that one. It's gone, and that was CS4, right? And as you can see, the bunny is cool. Very simple. So that was the desktop. You can do that. I actually picked the wrong one. Uh, this was desktop based. I need to remove that. Sorry. I need to remove that. It was CS5. And CS5 is based on. CS5, not I and I. That's going to be the VM. Step instead. And you can see the same thing going up here. In this case, it's a VM. And in that case, it's not going to do the do not create extra partition thingy. So that's one way of using rules. Uh, let's see another one as an example. Here it is. We can also use this. This is pretty neat. This is based on gateways. If you are on that certain gateway, in that case, you should do whatever you need to do. Here we go. Here it says, well, you know, we just add a section of default gateway. And default gateway will end up in this section, default gateway. And if the reply is that we're going to get that IP address back as the default gateway, well, then the subsection is going to be whatever it's going to be, and we're going to end up in that location instead. Which makes it kind of nice to have different language settings, different network settings, different whatever settings we need to have because we are in a different network location. And you can, of course, combine all this together. Uh, we can, of course, use make and model. Based on model, I would like to say if the model is a virtual machine, Hey, then it's OK. Then the bunny is cool, and the OS install is flipped to yes. We can also use like MAC address and specify this is the MAC address. And as Johan was showing you in the hydration solution he has, which is pretty convenient, I will create all the VMs. I can decide what I, a MAC address they should have. So in the PowerShell script where we create all the machines, we define all the MAC address they should have, which also apply them to, to these rule sets, which also makes every configuration pretty neat and pretty easy to do. And if you don't want to do that, well, there's other ways. Here's one pretty common one. Anybody use Lenovo computers? OK. Not for servers. Not for servers, but for, <laughs> for desktops. Anybody try that? OK. So the, the, the model number for Lenovo machines is, is kind of unique per model. Yeah. So they, they change the model number every, 
I think it's every day they change it. Because this was made on a Sunday, that's one model, and this is made on a Monday, so it has to be another model, right? And everybody loves that. Well, you can use other parameters. What we can do is that we can say, well, you know, let's, let's just do it another way. So by creating something called a user exit, we will force custom settings.ini to jump out do a VB script, return the value that is returned by the VB script into that parameter. So the result that we got from model alias exit, yes, is going to be inserted into model alias, which is pretty neat. And that's going to look pretty much like this. Uh, sorry, MDT production share scripts. I can't type in script. Um, CTI and getter. New file. Uh, colon. You missed the colon. Sorry. Now you can see it's um, doing all kinds of things. You can see here up it says, you know, I'm doing this CTI use the user exit VB script, and it's going to jump out and do that script and find out what's in that script. And if we open that up, it's going to look like this in scripts. The, sorry, CTI V user exit. Not bad. So it's going to begin with a section called user exit. That's going to always look the same. And in this case, I'm going to do a bunch of things. I'm going to get the SMB BIOS version. Pretty nice when you do BIOS upgrade. You want to know that. So you dim a bunch, and then you just do a VMI query. Next, verse, next block is going to be a set BIOS version, set product version, computer system number of processors, logical processors, CPU name, version, disk drive, battery status. One of the things that we have a problem with is, especially on, 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 in WinP for certain machines, maybe that utility really requires you to be powered on. And if you don't have power, then the application doesn't allow you to run. What, what we want to show with this script is that it's quite easy to, easy to extend MDT by have the rules file calling a VB script that in this case adds more and more functions that we can then call back and use in our environment. So if you want to have additional hardware information, it's quite easy to do so. So jumping over to HDAs. Yes. And uh, let me pick up my, my little, here's my folder. It's called stuff. All right. What we have done now is we have spent some time on configuring settings on the server side. But what if we want to have more flexibility when actually deploying the machines? Like customizing the wizard, add additional panes, change the existing ones so that we can have additional information for our server deployments uh, available just by the, by the click of a mouse when we start the deployment. There are scenarios where we don't want to have to pre-stage everything in advance, where we want a technician that actually deploys the server to simply kick off and select something and continue. And that we can do. Yeah. So here's the basic standard wizard. It looks like this. And you're using the wizard editor. I'm Coplex. using the wizard editor. Yes. I can't, I can't type, so. <laughs> this is fine, right? Um, and we have the computer backup here. We have the capture image here. And this doesn't really look the way normally a wizard does. It has added a feature. It says, do a VM capture of an image of this computer. Since you are almost talking about how to create a reference image, and that's fine. But in many cases, I would like to avoid the 
create an operating system, do a capture, do a WIM file, and then apply it to a VHD file. I mean, most common, most modern the virtual platforms support libraries. And we don't have to deploy these libraries. We can just copy them. Yeah. So there's no point of doing a capture when it's already running on a VM, which is a VHD file, right? The only thing I need to do is sysprep and turn it off. So the only thing I did here is add a new block. And this block, which is in here, yes, um, it's only going to specify, sorry, it's going to specify to, I just need to find the section. Oh, it's kind of. I thought you wrote this. Yeah, I did. But the problem <laughs> is to see the stuff. Um, here it is. It says checked value access key. I'm just checking where it is. Where it is. Do a VM capture. This is a VM deployment. Blah, blah, blah. It doesn't need to be captured. I know that. Oh, this is the wrong one. Sorry. It's old stuff. Open another one. MDT lab. It has to be on my C drive, right? Uh, is it in here? I'm just going to check if it's there. Scripts, otherwise, I need to fire up another machine. Uh, here it is. Here, here we, we yeah, here we did a bunch of modification. This is this is a customer that wanted this. He wants to see a page that gives him this kind of information before he installs the machine. To be able to see, yes, this is the correct hardware we're installing everything on. He also wanted to see the following stuff. He wants to know if every deployment parameter is correct. Is this machine being installed from the right location? Or where are we doing the log files? Is everything being correctly displayed? And in this case, it also picks up and, and populate what build account are you using? What account will be used to, to join in the domain? This is just for verification. It doesn't need to be here in all the time. So in some cases, he would like to turn it off. So how do you turn off a wizard page? Well, you just steal the code from somewhere else. Here's computer name, settings, condition. Obviously, if skip computer name is equal to yes, it or not equals to yes, it will not shown. Well, in that case, how hard could it be? Well, let's just invent something called skip hardware info. If skip hardware info is set to yes, it doesn't display. Is it really hard to do these pages? No, it's not. It's very simple. We also added this. You remember the email setting you had? Well, that is uh, using a bunch of variables that we have created. But now I had a question from a customer. It's fine, but we would like to be, you know, have the capability of typing in the email address because there's different technicians going to install different machines, and we don't want all the mail coming to one location. So could I just have the, yes, I would like to have a uh, notification you, uh, uh, via e email, and I would like it to have the following person. So in this case, it's just yes or no. I would like to have the log file, yes or no. And I would like to have the following subject, and I would like it to have to send to the following, to the following person. And there's other things like this. What, what do you think about this? It's a server OS. And now I can drop down in the list and say I would like to have the following server installed. So instead of creating 45 different task sequences, you can have one sequence. And within that sequence, you just select what part of the sequence should be run. If we check the code behind, Sorry, this is not code. This is HTML, so it doesn't classify as code. Code wannabe. <laughs> yeah, it's code wannabe. It's very, very advanced, right? It's just the select. And the option value here is via base selected, via DCR, via blah, 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 and so on. And it's just using that following variable, 
which I uh, create by define it in custom settings.ini custom properties. Then I need to add via server config. Or I can use roles and say via roles or just roles for that matter too. In the sequence then, if I have a sequence somewhere around here, oh, here's my deployment workbench. We just have these settings in the block. You see all these sections? I guess they have some kind of rules behind condition, it. Condition, right? Some kind of condition. So now I can have one image, one sequence, one modified wizard pane, and at deployment time, I say this. This is going to be a web server. This is going to be a SQL server. This is going to be a, I don't know. If you want to have a wizard, if you don't want to have a wizard, just put server config equals to based on that MAC address and skip this page. And then you're good to go. So you can choose and pick. All right. So back to the slides. And we talked a little bit about, or rather, I showed you in the sequences. But what is really up to, uh, we need vendor tools to do this, right? Yep. The trick is that to be able to do drivers, drivers is drivers, so that's vendors, but to do BIOS and array configuration and to do all these kinds of uh, um, network teaming things, we need to use the vendors toolkit. They are not really that good of, you know, oh, you want to do a customized light touch deployment then you need these tools. It doesn't really say so. It's hidden within other tools. So for instance, at HP, it's called the Rapid Server Deployment Toolkit that is supposed to be used with their own solution. But it's just a bunch of batch files or VB script. Download them, tweak them, modify them, throw them into the task sequence, and you're pretty much good to go. Now, the only trick we have is two, and that is... The only one we have is two? Yeah, yeah the only one problem <laughs> we have is two, and that problem is network adapter and teaming. So, how in the freaking do you really do teaming? What happens when you team a network adapter? It loses connectivity pretty much. Like, whew, there it goes. So, there are ways of fixing that, but we really need to make sure that we don't resume uh, traffic against the deployment share until the network adapter is really configured. So how, so would, you, uh, how would you recommend dealing with a scenario where we do have multiple NICs in the server and uh, sort of a... So what I do is very simple. I turn every network adapter off except the one I'm using during the complete process of the installation of the machine. In the end, I then turn them on and configure the teaming on the reboot of the machine. And that will work, work most likely. The other issue is repartition hard drives, or not repartition, recreating RAID configurations. Well, that's also tricky. One of the problems is that we really need to do that in the very beginning, because MDT and Light Chat is going to check if we have a hard drive. If we don't have a hard drive, it doesn't really allow us to continue. Well, one way is to actually say, well, you know, whatever hard drive you have, accept that. But in the, in the sequence, we just halt the process, wipe the disk, create a new one, and then we continue. It will never realize you actually changed all the hard drive configuration underneath. But that only works when we have some kind of partition. It needs to be something there. So as long as you have some kind of hardware, it works. If you don't have any kind of drive, because you really need to go into BIOS and configure that, well, then you need to fix it before we fire up the Light Touch Wizard script. That can be done, too. I've done it a couple of times. It's pretty messy, but it works. If I remember correctly, you actually wrote such a script. Yeah, for BIOS configuration, no, I have. for the uh, disabling NIC things. Yes, it's PowerShell. <laughs> uh, I need to post it. I don't think I have it here. Uh, 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 
<laughs> flip the switch. <laughs> flip the switch. That was Swedish for a short while, <laughs> even if it's very strange. I think I have it. Maybe I have it here. Oh, God. Tools. Do I have it here? Two seconds. I'm going to find it. Could be in here. Here we have all kinds of nasty little things. Yeah. Oh, well, it's almost the same. Here we have a very advanced script. It's going to import the Hyper-V module, and every time you want to play with Hyper-V and Hyper-V switches and networks and stuff, don't try to use VB script the way Microsoft tell you to. Just don't do that. They created the Hyper-V PowerShell library. It's on CodePlex. Now you have to write that much of code, which you can see on the screen. This is very simple. It's going to take the um, VM NIC MAC address, and it's going to uh, use that and create a switch for it. To disable it, I will remove the last couple of lines and add VM NIC parenthesis, disable, parenthesis instead, and that will do the same. So now I can specify in my custom settings.ini, this network adapter is going to be enabled, and the following network adapter is going to be disabled, which means that during deployment time, I only have one network adapter, and everything works really smooth. And in the end, I just turn them on back again, or disable them, or create VM switches, or whatever I need to do. All right, so if you... Uh Press stand, and one more. So we have now been discussing putting configurations into text files. We have been discussing doing things, customizing the wizard to prompt us for information. But what we also can use together with MDT is a database. It's an optional component, but it's easy to add it into the workbench. It can be either be a full server, uh, SQL server, but it can also be the free SQL Express. I know there are limitations on sizes, et cetera, on the SQL Express, SQL Express, but really, how much data do we actually put into it? Well, like 10 tables and like 10, 15, 20 records per machine. It's not a problem. Your database, even if you have like a thousand servers, like a hosting company, that database will be like 200 megs. So the size is not a problem. What is a problem, however, is that we are accessing this database when we start the deployment. So we are accessing the database from within WinPE. And we need to do a trusted connection. And the only way we can do a trusted connection is by doing a net use to a server share and then use those trusted connections to create, connect to the SQL, to the database because WinPE is not a member of the domain. To do this, we use the named pipes protocol. And that protocol isn't exactly new. It's been around for a while. So you need to convince your SQL DBAs to actually enable named pipes, which can be actually the most tricky part in this configuration. Uh, as, as long as you say, you know, enable named pipes, they go like, uh-huh. It's when you say you also need to share a folder on the SQL server. They go like, what? <laughs> well, you need a shared folder on it. Uh-huh. What's supposed to be in there? Nothing. Just share a folder. So we can one. connect to it. So yeah. we can connect to it. Then they get really suspicious, like, yeah, yeah, whatever, OK. I'm oh, not sure about that. All right. So anyway, the reason we use named name pipes is it's simply the most reliable way that we in WinPE can connect to a SQL database. I know we can use sockets type of connections, but they are less reliable. Simply named pipes is the best. What can you do if you can't use named pipes? What is your about only valid option here? You are not allowed to answer, sir. I know the answer. What is our options? TCP IP. No. You can use TCP IP. No, it's not reliable. No, no, but you can use it. <laughs> No. Put the SQL on the SQL, uh, MBT server. No, it's not the case. What can I do if I have a hard time convincing my DBAs? Web service. 
Web services, thank you. You can download or create your own web services. The web services talk with the database. Your boot image talks with the web services. Now the only protocol you need to have is HTTP, period. That's pretty cool. But can I have my, uh, thank you? D? Yeah. So when you work with the database, you first need to obviously create it. So you need to go to your deployment workbench. You go to your database node. You select new. You follow a little wizard, and then you have the database. After adding the database, you can start adding in your servers, for example. So you can stage them based on one of four identifiers, as a tag, UID, serial number, or MAC address. I selected MAC address. And then you can start adding in settings for this specific server. And in this case, I only set um, the computer name. But as you can see, we have like hundreds or a hundred different settings we can set, like IB addresses, default gateway, DNS server, AD configuration, things like that, domain to join, OU, inactive directory to put it in. We can add that information up here. And, and one thing that you could do, and we've seen come, some customers do that, is that they, they store the information of, of the computer in the database, right? But then they have like, I don't know, VMware or System Center Virtual Machine Manager, or you know, some kind of virtualization management platform. And most of these platforms today, they, they, they do PowerShell, right? So I can create a VM using a PowerShell script. But I can also extend PowerShell to be able to update the records in the database, which means that you could create a VM with this MAC address that also will be created in the database with all the settings it will have. Exactly. So now we can combine a uh, deployment solution for virtual machines together with the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit database. And everything goes in one line of a script. Create a VM based on the following settings, enter, and everything will be stored in a combination of the database and the uh, virtualization platform stuff. What you also can do in the database is start creating roles. Like, for example, you create a role base server. That's the server role you want to have. Yeah. For, for these servers, they are always supposed to um, uh, join the following domain mm -hmm. using uh, the following account. They should be put in the server uh, OU here. Um, So what we now can do is that John is adding a role, right? What I can do in the wizard page, if I would like to modify the wizard, instead of doing the via server config, I can change that into roles 001. And then I have the luxury of using roles from the database. So by picking a role, it will first most get all the settings from the database in that section and use that but also it will pick that certain configuration I have in custom settings.ini or whatever I have it. So it's going to be extremely flexible. Exactly. You just pick the server type and it's going to get all the parameters from different locations and just configure the server that way. Exactly. So I created a role and now of course I need to go back to my server and associate that role, one or more roles, with that machine. So this is how I connect the two unless I ask for it. I can also do uh, location-based settings, create different sites, different IP subnets. So I can have my uh, Stockholm site or Stockholm data center where I have the following gateways. can have more than one. Yeah, that's because you don't have a data center where you live. No, the town where I live is on the west coast and we don't have a data center there. So I normally steal his. Yeah. Because he has one. Yeah, I, I have a home. data center and he has a beach. <laughs> we have a nice beach in Halmstad, yeah. So here I can add different settings per site, for example. I can do also this with hardware. I can add in my different servers as a hardware type. Make HP and uh, uh, 
Maybe it's still the same version I have for my drivers here. So the ProLiant blade here, here we go. And now I can, for example, have settings for that specific model. Or why not add in applications from my application store that is for that specific model. And I can add in multiple ones. And uh, here we go. Uh, I can also sort them in what order they are supposed to be installed. So we can store every information that we want for our deployments in the database. And now we can also take this one more step further by taking all this, all the settings, all the sequences, all the databases, and actually put that in the perspective of using a provision-like environment. So I know that you happen to have. Yep. Let's flip it over. So in this case, this is System Center Virtual Machine Manager. And instead of installing the complete OS, I do have a ready-made sysprep VHD file. Just imported. It's just a blank sysprep image, right? And when I'm supposed to deploy this template, I say that, well, you deploy this template to the machine, fire it up, do an automatic log on as a local administrator, and run that. And that will do a net use against my deployment server, and it will run the LightTouch VB script, having an option in the end saying via server config colon web server, which will then pick up the sequence and do the rest of the configuration in that case. Two seconds. To get this to work, we still create sequences in LightTouch, but we create half sequences. We only create sequences that does the post OS installation. We completely take out all the actions that deploys the OS because we don't need to when we have a library. We are using library functions that just give us a clone of an OS. And then we execute the sequence that only will do that base server configuration, DNS, web server, SQL, whatever it is. And we save some, we save the entire time of deploying that OS. Yeah, so that means it takes roughly roughly 10 minutes to get the server laid down, another five minutes to configure it, and then it's done. Which is pretty OK. It's, it's almost like you can be waiting on the phone. Um, but really, well, anyway, that's the way it works. So there are different combinations. Fully deploying, VM deployment, relations with the database, using custom settings.ini, or whatever you like. So I think we tried most of these different scenarios. And it's, it's just a matter of how would you like to uh, manage your deployment scenarios. It's not about if it's impossible or not. It, it's, it's just a playground anyway. So what we like to do is open up for 4 and a six and a half whooping minutes of, of Q&A. And uh, if you need to run away for something, don't forget to fill in the evaluation. But do you have any questions? The Twitter feed has been awfully quiet. I don't have a question, but I do have a statement. We are working on a book called Server Deployment Using Light Touch. That's okay. volume number two. And volume number two. Three is going to be on zero touch for client side mostly. I think that's a shameless plug. It actually. is. <laughs> I don't really make any money on that book anyway, but we no, write. I, the, I take the money. Yeah, that, that's, yeah I know yeah. you take the money. We <laughs> yeah. write the book for the fun of it. Uh, it will be out this summer most likely. It's like seventy-five percent finished, something like that. Chapter six of eleven. <clears throat> yeah, no, yep. Fifty <laughs> then. Almost, yeah. All right. We'll be here if you have any more questions. Thank you for taking your time. Have a great take Thank you.